Well, um, this is the first of our China is not our enemy webinars from Code Pink. We want to be creating tools for how we as activists can lead to peace and not be used by lies and fears that drive wars and are fed by the Pentagon, the State Department, and the deep state. So at Code Pink last week, we did our first alert to our community calling on Biden to commit to before the convention the first strike. And we joined with Wolf and Wand and Mass Peace Action in sending that letter. Anne Wright, Colonel Anne Wright, participated in a Pivot to Peace conversation two weeks ago. And just this last weekend, Medea Benjamin participated in a global conversation to stop the looming Cold War between the US and China. We need to build a movement to stand in the way of the lies that we see growing every day. We have a head start that we didn't have with Iraq. At Code Pink, we say, stop the next war now. We started that with Iran um, when we first spoke it, but unfortunately it has increased to too many other countries in the world, and this is serious. I'm very excited to have as our first guest, Tabita Chow, who's been organizing campaigns for corporate accountability and racial economic justice in Chicago since 2009. He co-founded Justice is Global, a project of people's action that is focused on building a grassroots movement to win structural reforms to create an equitable and sustainable global economy. Yay. Tabita, welcome. And can you start by telling us about Justice is Global and how your work has been pivoting to China and the manufactured hate that is being fueled by those in Washington, D.C. of both parties? especially during this time of COVID pandemic. Sure thing. Thanks, Jody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I got to say it's an honor to be invited to this Code Pink event. Uh, I remember when I was like a political infant watching Code Pink uh, direct actions around uh, the Iraq war on TV and thinking like, wow, that's, that's really cool. Um, never thought that uh, I'd, be, I'd be working with you all like this. Um, so Justice is Global is a special project of People's Action. Uh, and, and People's Action is a national organization uh, made up of uh, a number of community organizations and progressive political organizations uh, across the country uh, working on issues of racial and economic justice uh, uh, and, and climate as well. Um, uh, and uh, we, Justice is Global has a specific mission of uh, winning a just and sustainable uh, global economy. Uh, we were founded at uh, People's Action uh, just over a year now. It was June uh, 2019. Um, and uh, before the pandemic, um, we were developing a campaign for a progressive alternative to the US-China trade war, which uh, laid some of the groundwork for the uh, escalation and tensions that we've been seeing in recent months. Um, and we were working with some of the member organizations of People's Action in swing states, uh, as well as uh, some groups working with rural communities um, who were being impacted uh, uh, very severely by the trade war. Um, so we have a, a background in working on US-China tensions from, from that perspective. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we could see that um, you know, not only was the pandemic going to take over U.S. politics, but it was going to become the dominant uh, question in uh, U.S.-China, the U.S.-China relationship specifically. Uh, so we uh, pivoted to uh, trying to develop some strategies for uh, how to uh, confront the rapid escalation in U.S.-China tensions that, you know, we knew from the beginning that that was going to be a major uh, uh, part of the political dynamic um, under the COVID-19 crisis that inevitably uh, the most hawkish elements uh, 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 among US elites were going to seize on that as an opportunity to uh, escalate uh, against China. Um, so since then we've been uh, building alliances, um, working on analysis and strat strategy, developing narrative tools to uh, counter the um, uh, uh, increasingly extreme anti-China narratives that we're seeing from particularly the Trump White House and the Republican Party and right-wing media. Um, we've also been developing a campaign for international cooperation 
to beat the pandemic uh, with a special focus on US-China cooperation uh, because we believe that lifting up the potential for cooperation between the US and China on uh, shared challenges, and most immediately that's the pandemic, uh, that that is a really important part of building an alternative to these escalating tensions that we see right now. You guys are doing a lot. So um, when you started um, Justice is Global, I moved to China part time. So it's just, I, I want to say like watching this happen in such a short period of time. I mean, I think, you know, it's just, I moved in April and everybody was just like, yay, China, it's so cool. Like, you know, and then slowly, slowly, the, it's just like, now, oh no. And then there's all these stories about how horrible China is and that they're our enemy now. <laughs> I'm just like, what, <laughs> nothing happened. Um, so maybe start with, what did you see when the pandemic started? Um, and as, as, was that used? Um, did you watch a shift as you were engaged in this? Yeah, um, I think the first thing that I experienced when the pandemic hit, and this was very early on in early February, um, I started, I, I, I experienced uh, anti-Asian racism. Uh, there was uh, an incident in downtown Chicago uh, where I was walking along and uh, sort of walking in front of me was uh, uh, an Asian woman. Uh, uh, who turned out to be uh, a, a Chinese immigrant uh, who uh, got accosted by just a complete stranger who then uh, yelled at her and, and spat in her face. Um, and that was like my first taste of the rapid escalation in anti-Asian racism that came as part of the popular reaction to the pandemic, um, blaming it on China, associating it with Chinese people, and then by extension, um, just a broad range of, of Asian people uh, in general because so much of this country can't tell any of us apart. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I anticipated that that would be an important part of the reaction and that was very quickly confirmed in early February. And then since then there's been, um, you know, some, some organizations that have tracked uh, uh, incidents of anti-Asian harassment and violence and there's, there's been uh, thousands uh, since then. Um, uh, the, the other thing that uh, we were uh, tracking was uh, some of the right-wing media discourse uh, around the, the pandemic, which moved very quickly towards narratives of blaming China and shifting very quickly into the realm of conspiracy theories, um, sometimes mixed in with uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, there's, yeah, the right-wing conspiracy theories nowadays are always about, uh, you know, who's pulling the strings, it's, it's um, Jews, or it's the Chinese, or maybe a mixture of both. So that's sort of the range of, of uh, the ideology on the right nowadays. Um, uh, so we saw these conspiracy theories um, and these blame China narratives, uh, they, were, they were being developed and, and we saw right-wing figures investing a lot of energy in them. So for example, Tucker Carlson on Fox News was um, a major leader in this. Um, and that they were starting that before it ever made it into Trump's mouth in, in the White House. Like Trump didn't get to that stuff until um, uh, mid to late March, uh, I think March 18th or something like that. But um, it was being developed well before that. So that's what we were seeing coming. Uh, and, and we knew that there were um, independently of the pandemic, um, a growing set of forces uh, among US elites um, in both parties actually, actually who have been agitating for years now for a more confrontational uh, approach uh, to China um, uh, and that they, it was predictable that they would use this rise in anti-China sentiment as an opportunity uh, to uh, try to build greater popular support for their anti-China agenda. Because the challenge that they have faced for years is that um, there's not a lot of public appetite for increasing confrontation with China, people are sick of the wars that we're already in. Um, why would anyone uh, uh, think favorably about the prospect of engaging in a war with uh, a, a much more powerful uh, country? Um, you know, it, it, that's, that just doesn't make sense. But there has been this increase in anti-China sentiment under the pandemic. So um, for some of these hawks, that's an opportunity. So 
So let's just look at that. I mean, this is not, this is a game plan that has been played out on the US people for a really long time. Um, nobody wanted the Iraq war either. And that was trumped up and the lies and created fear. I mean, Code Pink uh, started around the terror, terrorist alerts that were color coded, orange, red, and yellow. And we called Code Pink for peace because they were frightening the, they were used to frighten the American people into voting for war. And so, you know, when you say that there's, there are those, um, in the capitalist, you know, uh, corporate circles, who see China as an economic threat um, to what to U.S. hegemony, uh, you know, global hegemony, and we've seen that for a really long time. You've seen BRICS come out of that, and where that doesn't look like a really good idea to the rest of the world, and they work on creating a balance. So there are those that aren't interested in that balance, but I think you know where we watch the. The, the lies being driven to create um, an enemy. And again and again, what, how, how do we look at that as activists? And um, okay, here it's happening again. Here's the game plan. We're watching it. It's rolling out. And um, you know, Vijay Prashad did an amazing job of breaking down the lies that were being used to hate China. And you know, that China kept it a secret and instead, you know, that they didn't tell us until like June, I mean, he said some later date, but they told us in December. And even the US CDC doctor said, I was called by the Chinese head of the CDC crying to warn us about what was happening, not just warn, but like really this is serious. So that discrepancy between what is true and what is being driven is, um, we know as anti-war activists is where we need to insert ourselves. And so kind of we're watching this wave grow and we want to enter. Um, so you're telling us how this is happening, but what, how do we look at this as activists and say, how do we insert ourselves in this moment? Because also we know that sanctions that are also being driven by the Trump administration on Iran and Venezuela and Iraq um, and uh, sorry, Cuba, um, they drive also nationalism. And so in, in this time where we see the world is global and we're all suffering from a pandemic and what should be happening is cooperation and connection and understanding we're a global economy um, and global climate change, which the effects of that are gonna make COVID look like child's play. So um, what, you know, how do we also, not become nationalists, not drive nationalism, and debunk all this? What, you know, that's a big question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you know, the, the task of um, debunking uh, some of these uh, arguments and even conspiracy theories um, from the anti-China hawks, uh, that, that, that's, that's a big task. It can very quickly get very complicated. It requires a lot of like background knowledge, um, uh, about, about China that, um, uh, you know, is, is not necessarily accessible to a lot of people. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you talk about some of the accusations about, um, uh, that, uh, it's, it's, you know, ch China lied and that's the reason why things are so bad here. Um, uh, you can read, there are some long articles that are quite good about spelling out the timeline and so on. And so, you know, there were some missteps, uh, by officials, uh, in China. Uh, you know, my understanding is, th is that the biggest missteps were, uh, from local officials in Wuhan who were acting out of motivations that should be very familiar to us when we look at the missteps from Trump and Republican governors. They were worried about um, the economic impact of overreacting to the pandemic. It's like, well, you know, the the, the information still got getting out. Uh, if we if we uh, if we set off the red alarm now about a pandemic, uh, that will hurt the economy and that will delegitimize us politically. Um, so those are, you know, looking back, like bad reasons to hold off on raising the alarm over this pandemic. Um, uh, but you know, this, you know, I think the anti-China hawks turn this into this uh, exotic thing that is, that is uh, particular to China, when in fact we can see uh, those same motivations playing out in the U.S. 
uh, and in, in fact, like uh, by any reasonable standard, it's playing out much worse in the U.S. than it, it played out in China. Like there were temporary delays in China. In the U.S., it's been months, and we have Republican leaders still running with that playbook, which is totally uh, destructive. Um, I think like uh, a good place to start is to get clear on what the most important driving motivations are uh, behind the anti-China hawks um, and to sort of critique everything um, that they say uh, from that perspective. So um, there, there's uh, two related strands of concern. One is military and the other is economic. Um, so under the, uh, the, the, the military uh, concern is that, uh, so we start out uh, with, if you're a member of the national security elite in the US, you start out with um, a basic uh, dogmatic commitment to US global military hegemony, all right? So the idea is that the US military uh, or alternatively the militaries of US allies is going to control ideally every square mile of the planet. Um, and if you start out with that basic commitment, Isn't then- Isn't that imperialism? Yes, that is what that is another <laughs> word for that. Um, Thank you. And uh, if you start out with uh, that basic commitment, then yeah, China is going to seem like a threat. Uh, so, for example, a big a big flashpoint is the South China Sea, um, where the Chinese military has been building up its presence and uh, making claims over which waters are count as Chinese territory that uh, conflict with the claims of other countries in that region. Um, so uh, um, that is perceived by US militarists as a threat to the US. While it is a threat to US military hegemony, it's a threat to US imperialism, um, that does not mean that it is a threat to like any living um, American person other than the ones that we, we send over on, with the Navy and so on, right? Like, um, so, uh, that's, that's sort of the, the military uh, perspective, which then gets uh, blown up uh, enormously uh, into um, the, these hugely inflated images of, of the Chinese threat. So uh, Secretary of State Pompeo last week um, talked about uh, the, the military conflict with China in like apocalyptic terms. He said, it, uh, he had a quote of something like, um, if we bend the knee now, then our children's children will be dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, right? It's, it's this image that um, if we don't confront China in the South China Sea right now, then um, they're coming to take over the United States, um, which is just this bizarre, paranoid uh, fear for which they're like, you know, China doesn't want to run the US. Like, this place is a mess. Like, <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, and in fact, uh, the, you His know, this tweet right after that said, but really they were doing what they were doing and that China was evil. So that China would change their behavior, uh -huh. um, you know, not so that we would be forced into something, but this is a force for China to change their behavior. Yeah. So it is in fact changing China's behavior, um, but not in the ways that uh, the U.S. military hawks uh, advertise, right? So it is... Um, the, the, the impact that this is having in China, it, 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 it's feeding Chinese nationalism, it's making uh, the Chinese leaders more defensive and, and fearful. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, it is a reality that the Chinese military is building up its presence in the South China Sea, um, and maybe some of the neighboring countries are rightfully afraid of what that will mean for them. But a lot of that is motivated by a justifiable fear that, um, the U.S. military presence uh, threatens to um, like strangle China in its own backyard, right? So um, that fear of of the U.S. military presence, and we have to remember, like, there's a string of U.S. military bases surrounding China, right? Um, uh, um, uh, I think we can hopefully sympathize with the Chinese leadership's fear that this is going to be increasingly become a threat to them, particularly as as China continues to rise in the world. Um, and, uh, and that they need to establish a foothold in their surrounding territory in, in order to protect themselves from the threat of, of the US military, right? So um, this increasingly 
uh, aggressive and, and bellicose rhetoric and actions from the US actually feeds in to these actions from China that we interpret as aggressive, right? Um, so there's, we're getting this like really destructive feedback loop, which the Trump administration has done everything in its power to accelerate. Um, and in, in fact, uh, there was an article in the New York Times earlier this week that I think just nailed it on, on the head, saying that the Trump administration is trying to push the US-China relationship past the point of no return. Um, they want to poison the relationship so badly that uh, e you know, even if they lose power to Biden and the Democrats in November, and even assuming you know, the best intentions on the part of, of a Biden administration and, and Democrats in Congress, that they'll be unable to repair the damage that uh, the Trump administration wants to do uh, between um, now and, and, and uh, in the months to come. Um, so uh, that's what we're dealing with uh, on the side of sort of the military hawks that are driving this conflict. Um, there's another side to it that's related, which is um, economic nationalism uh, and anti-China economic nationalism, uh, which uh, uh, stems from the fact that uh, Chinese, China's economy has not only been uh, growing, but really advancing, and that we are in a place now where uh, uh, Chinese tech companies are uh, real competitors to the US tech industry. Um, and this is a problem because uh, on the one hand, um, th these are the most profitable industries in the global economy nowadays. Um, and the US wants to maintain control of them. Um, because the, the most profitable uh, industries, they're also the source of the greatest power in the global economy. Um, so the US is very jealous of its control over this tech sector. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, you know, we have to see that there are these global systemic problems where uh, the global economy never fully recovered from the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. And global economic growth has been um, very mediocre since then, in particular in recent years, um, which has pushed the US and China into the sense of zero-sum competition over economic growth. And these like highly profitable sectors are, are particularly important if, you're, if these two countries are sort of competing with each other over who's gonna get um, a larger, the larger piece of this like shrinking pie of, of global economic growth, which um, you know, both countries rely upon. Um, uh, so the, the tech sector is, is super important for maintaining um, like high corporate profits in this increasingly um, uh, hostile economic environment, which is only getting that much worse under the pandemic, right? Um, so, uh, you know, there's all this jealousy around protecting the, the tech sector. Um, uh, and then a final point there is that um, in the minds of uh, the national security establishment, uh, the US tech industry is basically a wing of the military industrial complex. Um, so losing uh, supremacy and the tech industry uh, for the militarists also implies uh, the threat of thereby losing uh, military superiority um, because so much of uh, military advances are dependent on tech advances. So if you don't control the most, like the top players in the tech industry, how can you control military supremacy? So this is a big fear that they have about the advances in the Chinese economy. So we have the militarists and the economic nationalists sort of combining to really push this agenda forward. So, well, let's just get back to the human beings. Um, <laughs> you mentioned earlier that people generally in the United States are not really gung-ho on a war with China, but they don't really notice the boiling water or the steps that continue to escalate, just as you have really well laid out, is like, this is really happening and happening quite quickly. I mean, literally, you know, a year ago, China's going along, there are friends, you know, it's like, let's live in this world together. And, you know, they're going to grow, they are committed to their people, you know, let's look at, I think, the they've taken an estimate of 500 million people out of poverty. Um, so and then we're in a country <laughs> that is a is falling apart. Uh, that's kind of, you know, certainly not there for the people. So you um, you didn't bring up that kind of difference of like the for a really long time, uh, the United States has 
killed an awful lot of people because they were communist. Um, so that, I don't know where that, is that actually absent in the conversation? Because um, it's certainly the thing the US has been afraid of since World War II and why they dropped a nuclear bomb was to show that they were powerful and um, you know, to scare the communists basically. So here we are back in history to this moment. And um, I just, it wasn't there. And I, I, it's, I think part of why people don't wanna talk about it, like, like why even progressives or left are afraid to talk about this is that it does bring up this conversation that is so about what the US has been about for a really long time. I mean, the U.S. built on slavery, built on genocide, and then built on the murdering of um, innocent communists around the and 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 many of them uh, Asian. Um, so, where is that in here? Because I think if we don't talk about it, it's partly what keeps everybody quiet. Because it's like, oh my God, if I say something positive about China, I'm a communist, or you know, and I and and right now in the middle of um, you know, Trump's insanity, it's also underneath that is the United States of America that is built on um, genocide and slavery and, um, you know, basically run by corporations instead of a government or the government is run by the, you know, so um, does that in, in, in between those two, is that, is that river flowing or is that, um, does that come up? Uh, do they operate without it? I don't know. Um, yeah, so you mentioned like red baiting. Um, and I think we're seeing uh, a return to uh, red baiting and uh, attempts to revive a kind of like new McCarthyism, um, uh, uh, you know, combined with like uh, uh, extra layers of, of racism because, um, you know, back in the original Cold War, the, the enemy was uh, uh, Russia. Now it's a, um, a majority person of color country so that there's an extra layer of racism that comes in there. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, this problem of red baiting from uh, the right is uh, going to become more and more of an issue and it's going to become unavoidable. Um, the right is trying to cast every political question as a question of, are you with the United States or are you with China? Um, it's trying to recast every political question uh, in that light. So um, they've attempted to do this around Black Lives Matter uh, by associating the Black Lives Matter protests uh, with China. Um, and there's a range of stories they tell. Um, one uh, is that uh, the Black Lives Matter protests are uh, to the advantage of China. They're advantageous to China because they're creating uh, chaos in the US, which therefore helps the Chinese Communist Party. Um, it then escalates from that to uh, conspiracy theories about um, uh, claiming that China is funding the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, that China is actually coordinating the supposed Antifa agents uh, that are, that have corrupted Black Lives Matter from a legitimate protests to like looting and rioting. Uh, there were even accusations from some uh, people on the right that uh, uh, members of the Chinese military were present in protests and sort of leading, um, uh, 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 you know, violent acts within the protests. Um, so, uh, you know, this is an attempt to associate Black Lives Matter as allied. Uh, either um, directly or indirectly with China. So if you're on the side of Black Lives Matter, then you're with China and you're against, you're a traitor to the United States, right? That's the argument. Um, the recent fight over the US military budget, like US versus China was all over that. Um, uh, Trump uh, a couple weeks ago made this big speech in the Rose Garden uh, that was about bashing China and, and then accusing Biden of being on China's side. And um, uh, he brought up the efforts to defund the military uh, as a gift to the Chinese Communist Party. This is about weakening the US and empowering China. Um, he also brought up uh, climate politics. He said that the Paris Climate Accords was um, an attack on the US manufacturing uh, sector 
and a gift to the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and that it was Joe Biden who made this gift to, um, to the communists. Uh, and I mean, you know, there are different versions of this for other issue areas, but um, uh, in general, we see, oh, uh, accountability for uh, tech companies. Um, Mark Zuckerberg has been making this argument for a while. He's going to keep making it that um, uh, we need to not uh, uh, regulate Facebook in a way that could har harm Facebook's business model, because if we do, then the Chinese social media companies are going to overtake the U.S. social media companies, right? So this plays out um, uh, across a range of issues, and um, it's something that uh, uh, is going to just come up more and more, I think. So I, I thought Biden's response to that was interesting that he uh, got his campaign to say they weren't going to be on TikTok. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, I, I want to take in a question from the uh, the audience. Um, Carol Ardess asks, do you think that a war with China would remain in the economic struggle or become a nuclear war? Um, I'm not going to make any predictions. However, I think the tendency is towards military confrontation, um, to be honest. And uh, the risk of any military confrontation escalating into nuclear confrontation is, um, I mean, I want to say it's unthinkable, but uh, I think there's a real chance um, of that. Uh, the, uh, like I said before, the, the idea of economic conflict is really closely tied to uh, the, the interests of the national security establishment in the US. So these are, in, in their minds, these are not separate issues, right? The economic conflict and the military conflict are just two sides of the same coin that ultimately ends in military conflict. That's what it's ultimately about. Um, we have to, you know, you know, I, I, I would like to think that even in the event of a military confrontation that um, at least the, the Chinese government would avoid nuclear escalation. Um, I mean, that is their, their policy. Um, uh, but, you know, there are just so many other, like one, one scenario that I've, I've worried about in recent weeks is the way that other countries in like these, these major conflicts are sort of aligning with the US versus China great power conflict. Um, so, you know, for example, we're starting to see um, Israel, well, no, we have seen Israel, uh, which has gotten more and more extreme aligning with the US government, the Israeli government and the US government. Uh, in response to that, we're seeing uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Iranian government aligning more with the Chinese government. Uh, we're seeing uh, an increasing, the emergence of an alignment between the US government and the Indian government. Uh, and there's this decades long conflict between India and Pakistan. We're starting to see the Pakistani government aligning with the Chinese government. Um, and there are a lot of nuclear weapons uh, within that list of, of countries. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we should think, I, I think the Cold War is like not the best model for us. We should be thinking more along the lines of the escalation towards World War II. I think the dynamics are much more similar to that. Um, and how conflicts in one place can translate rapidly into, con into these other conflicts that are, are in, in, based on these alignments and how new alignments can emerge in unexpected ways um, very, very quickly. And so if things break out between the US and China and that's translating into conflicts between um, India and Pakistan and Iran and, and Israel, um, there are just so many opportunities for someone to make a bad call. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we need to do everything possible to uh, avoid this path and create a new path that is focused on international cooperation as a real alternative. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for really raising how serious this is to be. I think that um, it's hard for people to hear, 
but you know, the US has dropped a nuclear bomb. Uh, there are people in the White House that think we've well, got to cover, so we're fine, and, and that we could do it and nothing would happen. So there's, we know there's delusional thinking inside of the power of the US that is quite frightening. I'm sure it frightens the Chinese government and an escalate, another escalation of nuclear weapons is not something this planet needs or the people on the planet need. And we want to deescalate you know, for that also, just it's like more creation of more nuclear warheads and weapons is is itself a horrible thought. Um, but you know, it's it's in the works, and and as you described, China would have to do that because it just starts to look like your job is to take care of the 1.5 billion people in your country. Um, so. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left, and I'm so happy it, it ended with, yes, this is very, very serious. <laughs> so um, now what can we be doing? Um, we're peace activists, and um, what are some things that you could tell us we should be doing? Yes, uh, before I move on to that, one last point to make is that uh, uh, there's an, a White House official, Michael Billingsley, who I think is ironically uh, in charge of arms control, who said that we ought to engage China and also Russia in a new nuclear arms race because uh, we are because if we do that, then we can uh, quote spend them into oblivion. So um, horribly delusional and um, nihilistic, uh, but you know that thinking is at work, like an embrace of a new nuclear arms race, um, even though that that spells like doom for us as a species. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very serious. So what should leftists uh, what should all of us be be doing? Um, I think uh, uh, the most important thing is to build uh, grassroots power, um, to build at the grassroots, um, organize people who understand the importance of this issue. Um, I have uh, this this fear that um, as this start, stuff started to escalate, um, our movements as a whole were really caught sort of flat-footed. Um, the U.S.-China relationship isn't a thing um, that uh, most, most of our organizations are used to really thinking uh, about um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding China is a huge undertaking. So, like, um, uh, uh, like uh, I understand the difficulties that people have in, like, uh, 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 thinking about these questions, um, but uh, we need to build grassroots power uh, among people who are clear about the dangers of this growing conflict and the need to create an alternative. Um, and uh, I think part of this is engaging in more political education uh, around the US-China relationship and also about you know, the Chinese economy, Chinese politics, uh, uh, Chinese society. Um, uh, there is a need to construct uh, new narratives uh, to counter the, uh, the anti-China narratives that are being pushed uh, uh, um, very intensely um, from the right in that, you know, and even in versions of them also show up uh, within the establishment in the Democratic Party. Um, this is a bipartisan phenomenon. Uh, we need more powerful counter narratives um, uh, uh, in, in order to like fight back against those narratives. Uh, something that we've been doing at Justice is Global is uh, we just finished a a few weeks of um, testing uh, some narrative tools uh, with voters in swing states in, in Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, and what we did is we leaned into uh, narratives of how the US and China could cooperate to come up with real solutions to this pandemic and end it more quickly. Um, and that uh, these, these escalating tensions between the two countries are just incompatible with all of us coming together as a global community to come up with real solutions to this very urgent problem. Um, you know, you can make a similar uh, argument around climate. Uh, I think all the same arguments transfer over to the, the climate crisis, um, but uh, the pandemic is much more in people's minds right now. Uh, so we need to like move those narrative tools out. Um, uh, Justice is Global is, is working on uh, coming up with a toolkit and things like that around uh, and writing a report uh, about this work. Um, and we wanna get other progressive organizations uh, to take this up uh, as well as uh, progressive candidates uh, for office uh, in these upcoming November elections. Uh, I think there are probably a lot of progressive candidates out there who know that they need an alternative 
uh, line on what to say about China, but aren't sure what that is. Um, and so we want to help uh, develop that. Um, and uh, I think um, finally, uh, we should uh, find ways to increase the pressure on the Biden administration to uh, move to a better place um, on these issues. Um, you know, I want to give uh, Biden and the Democrats some credit for uh, refusing to engage in some of the most inflammatory and con conspiratorial rhetoric that we see uh, on the right, but I am concerned that they are maintaining too much of the framework uh, that has been developed by the anti-China military hawks and by the economic, the anti-China economic nationalists, and that uh, without uh, uh, much more pressure uh, from us, uh, they are going to be uh, unable to chart a, a new path in the U.S.-China relationship, and and they'll find themselves uh, embracing this like spiraling conflict, um, which, which is the plan of the Trump White House, that they will lock in a U.S.-China conflict that Biden and the Democrats will be unable to uh, undo. Oh, great. Well, that's a great way to articulate it. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more question from John Cavana. The climate movement has long pointed out that reaching the UN greenhouse gas targets to save the planet requires major reductions by both the US and China. You've pointed out that there are many problems with Biden. How do you think we can create grassroots pressure on both governments for massive reductions? Before you answer, I just also, um, John, just to say there's a Harvard uh, study that just came out last week that um, I found interesting and in that 95% of the people in China are worried about climate change and are engaging in personal behaviors changes around it. So um, that grassroots, that's an interesting thing that I don't think Americans are, are well aware of, but I'll, Tabita, I'll give it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this is related, one, one, one other thing I wanna mention is that uh, Justice is Global, we're developing a campaign uh, to, uh, uh, pressure the US government to uh, implement a plan for US-China cooperation around the pandemic. Um, uh, and uh, I, think, I think, you know, we can do something very similar to that. So this isn't our work immediately, um, but we wanna look forward to doing something very similar around uh, climate change. And um, there is uh, so much potential in US-China cooperation um, around climate. Uh, we need to be honest in the U.S. that uh, the, the Chinese government has done, um, in many ways, a much better job than the U.S. in uh, 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 pushing for the development of clean, clean energy uh, industries. Um, there are a number of clean energy industries where uh, Chinese firms have scaled this up at, uh, to a degree that um, just outstrips uh, anything that exists in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world, actually. There's sort of a leader in a lot of these industries. Um, and uh, we need to uh, think about um, what does U.S.-China cooperation look like uh, that recognizes that China is actually bringing uh, a lot to the table and that we need to um, recognize that um, as an asset in our shared efforts to uh, combat climate change um, and not see it as, as a threat, which is uh, a tendency that's all too common even among um, progressives like worrying about, uh, oh, is China going to dominate the clean energy industries of, of the future? Um, if that's our concern, then the enormous investments they've made in clean energy industries then appears as a threat. That's totally backwards. Uh, we should be thankful that there is a country that has made those investments. And we, we need to think about um, how we can work together to deploy those uh, in the US globally in a way that is going to work uh, both for the majority of people in China and also, you know, we can do this in a way that also creates jobs in the U.S. There's more than enough work to go around. Um, like that doesn't have to be something that we're anxious about. Thank you for that. Well, so to be to thank you, it has been so lovely to have this conversation with you. You are um, wealth of knowledge and commitment and passion. So uh, everyone can find justiceisglobal.org and also follow Tabita on Twitter at Tobita C. Um, and then uh, we also have a lot of tools on codepink.org backslash China. Uh, there is a newsletter that's coming out from China uh, with some other news that could make you a little smarter than 
the um, mainstream media is trying to drive about China. I, you know, both, I think both Americans and Chinese get to know, get, should get to know each other. And, and what can we do to help that happen? Because we remember it's really, it's the governments and, and as people, we know we want peace and justice and um, find out ways we can connect and really understand the seriousness that should be to talked about of the racism that this is driving. And, and, you know, at the core as Americans, we should really be seeing that and see what we can do to help in the Chinese communities in the United States first, too. And I know there's organizing happening there. So I hope we'll all engage and um, do our best to work towards peace and justice. And thank you, Tabita. Peace. Thank you so much. Peace.